So in this episode, we have fun with rails. Then we have even more fun with rails. And just when you thought you had all the rail fun you can handle, we find a way to have more fun with rails. So to recap, we have fun with rails, more fun with rails, and then so much rail fun, we won't be able to stand it. It's gonna be a good time. Time to get started on sub rails, and I'm going to use a lamination for this. Now, I know what you're thinking. You got a, I got a big piece of wood here. I can just make a sub rail out of this, and it should be fine. Well, I'm a firm believer that laminations are much more stable. I'm going to take my time and be certain that I'm making a true and flat rail, and I don't want this thing to twist over time. I think a lamination will be much more resistant to that, so that's why I'm doing it. So I'll rip these down to size on the table saw, then I'll glue them all together, and then we'll start actually doing the milling to actually make the sub rail. Well the rails came out really nice. The lamination turn, took well and they are very flat and true. I'm very happy with how these came out. Now what I'm doing is I'm just trimming them down to the final dimensions and the height in this case is 1 and 25 30 seconds. I've set up my saw. I've triple checked my gauge to make sure because I want to be precise here. And I'm going to run each piece through and then I'll flip them over and do the final dimensions on this edge as well. Perfect. Five more. Well, I've got my sub rails down to the final dimensions. Now it's time to start milling the details on them. And what I've done is, I'm, you probably can't see this, but I've taken the time to lay out the actual profile on the first piece that I'm going to cut. I have some test blocks here that I'm using to test my cuts as I go before, after every adjustment. And I'll run each piece through, double, triple, and checking as long as I go. Now that is one part of the groove for the feather board, and I'm going to move the fence to take out the final cut, then I'll nibble away the inside. That looks good, 5 sixteenths. You can see I'm checking often. All right, once I made those cuts, I adjusted the fence to take out the middle portion of them. The grooves and I have a groove for my feather strip. Now we'll start cutting the angles for the actual rails. Now I set my saw blade at 6.7 degrees to make this small angle here. That 
that looks good, I'll run the rest. I've now set my blade to 19 degrees. I'm flipping my pieces over and I'm going to run this angle here. Five more just like that. Now I've adjusted my blade to about 41 and a half degrees to make this angle here. I've already run one, I'll run the rest. I got a little chunk of my rail that I cut off to use as guide and that looks perfect. I'll run the rest of them. Now I've lowered my blade and set it to 45 degrees and I'm going to cut the relief for the veneer. All right, we're done with the angles. I'll return the fence, I'll return the blade to 90 degrees and remove the rest of the veneer relief. So my blade's back to 90, I got it to the proper height. I'll go ahead and cut this relief out. I got myself some sub rails. Now if I can just get them stupid pockets to come in. I ordered them two weeks ago and they're still not here. I can't really do anything else until I get those in. Hmm, what else can I do? Well my pockets finally decided to show up. It took a while but they finally got here and it allowed me to spend some time with the SketchUp model trying to figure out how everything's gonna line up get all my angles laid out. Now, I ran into a bit of an, well, not a bit of an issue, I ran into quite an issue. I want my pocket openings from point to point to be five inches. Well, my pockets themselves are about five inches wide, so that leaves me a bit of an issue. How do I set my pockets to five inches, then also have my pocket openings be five inches? I can't, unless I get creative. So what I decided to do is I decided to make a little recess in the end of my sub rails so that the pockets will fit in there, then still allow my pocket opening to be five inches. The pocket should tuck into, the, tuck into this little cove fairly well. And I'm not sure, to be honest, I'm not really sure if this is gonna work all that well. Um, it may not, it may, look, it may look terrible. Now most side pockets are about five and a half inches, but I really want mine to be five. So I'm hoping that this little cove idea will work. But if it doesn't, I can always lop this off later and end up with a five and a half inch side pocket. Not ideal, but if I have to, I have to. Good news about the corners though, I don't have any of these issues on the corner pockets, so I can just cut those off traditionally and I shouldn't have any issues whatsoever. All right, I've got my dimensions for the width of my sub rails and I'm gonna actually use my crosscut sled for this because I can actually use my miter gauge so I can get an exact cut every time. And I have double and triple checked my measurements on this because once I do this, there's no going back. So I wanna make sure I do this right the first time. 36 and 9 64ths. Perfect. I've got my sub rails cut to the proper length and I've taken the time to mark the location of each hole for the um, pocket ears. And unfortunately I don't have a drill press tall enough to mount these because that would be ideal. So I have to do these by hand. I'm gonna mount them in the vise and just be certain that I'm drilling at a 90 degree angle because I want those holes straight. 
and I'm also going to make sure I go about two inches deep. Well, I got the holes drilled for my pocket ears, and I'm not overly happy with how they came out. I had a heck of a time keeping that drill bit from wandering into this end grain. And so they didn't come out perfectly well, but they're going to be bolted from underneath, so it shouldn't be an issue. If it turns out to be an issue, what I'll do is I'll route out this portion, I'll put a filler block in there, glue it in, and I'll redo it. Hopefully I don't have to, but if I do, that is an option for me. So now, oh, also one more thing. I was, every table that I looked at when I was doing my research, every production table I was looked at when I was doing my research for the design of this thing, had the end rails cut in a 90 degree angle. And what ended up happening is every table I looked at had a big gap between the leather and the, and the rail. I don't want that. So I looked in my pocket and the, this is about a 10 degree angle here. So I'm gonna cut my end rails at 10 degrees also. And also I'm doing the side pockets right now, so I'm gonna be working with that little cove that we talked about. So I've got my miter gauge set up to 10 degrees. I got my rip fence set to the proper length so I can just butt my piece up. And I've run, actually run a test block and everything fits pretty good. I'm really happy with how that pocket just tucks into that little cove here. Should turn out well. That looks good. Now I'll take it over to the compound miter box saw and I'll cut my compound angles for the pocket openings. Okay, I got the side pockets. I got that cove cut on all the side pockets. Now I'm doing, doing the same detail to the corner pockets absent the recess. Once again, this goes to the compound miter box and I'll make the angles for the pocket openings. I've got my down angles all set and cut from the table saw. Now it's time to do the compound miters and I got my compound miter box saw set up to do the corners right now. And in my case, my corner angle is going to be 39 degrees or as your table mechanics like to call it, 141. Now I'm fortunate enough that I, my compound miter saw, I can go both ways. A lot of them you can't. So, and also a 15 degree down angle. And my cut point is just the back corner where the feather strip opening is. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a cut, see how far I am, then make my adjustments an inch in on it slowly. Beautiful, corner pocket. Now I just did the side pockets and the side pocket openings are 12 degrees again with a 15 degree down angle. And for my cove I got a little bit of material left here. And what I'll do with that is I'll remove that with just a handsaw and clean it up with a chisel. Now I'm just using a dovetailing saw to remove the rest of this material. There are better saws for this job than this but this is what I have so it's what I'm using. I'll just take my time and let the saw do the work. Boy, a sharp chisel makes this job a dream. If you do not know how to sharpen your own tools, learn. It's really easy, really inexpensive. In fact, when I first started sharpening my own tools, I used a piece of ceramic tile with some wet dry sandpaper on it. It worked great. That is beautiful. Well, I spent some time and I actually, with pencil, I actually drew lines and marked on the slate itself where my actual playing surface was gonna be. And I just used a tiny square, I temporarily attached the cushions with um, just some blue 
painter's tape and got everything all lined up and I came across a bit of an issue. I was having a lot of problems getting things lined up and the reason for that is because the holes that I drilled in the end rails were so bad that I just had to address them. So what I decided to do is I decided to spend some time at the router table and actually route out route out the spot where the pocket ears are going to go and then I was going to fill it and re-drill it but then I'm thinking well okay I can do that but how what's to prevent me from drilling terrible holes once again and then it occurred to me that you know what a round peg really will really will go into a square hole if it's the right size so I figured I would just leave my rabbits dados grooves whatever you want to call them in in place because the pocket ears can be bolted down from the bottom. So really the only portion that's important is the bottom of my groove here. So I'm actually going to leave these the way they are. And by doing this, this also allows me to get very precise on my when I drill my holes for my pocket ears instead of trying to measure and trying to guess and hope I get close and have some fudge room. This way I can do it and I can be precise. So what do they say? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Now we didn't recreate the wheel here or anything, but I think I really, I think this is going to work out better than it than just using the hole. So I'm happy about that. So now that I got everything clamped into place and everything's looking really good, everything everything lines up beautifully. I am going to go underneath the table and mark the locations of my rail bolts. Then once I do that, I'll take everything apart. I'll go over to the drill press and drill the holes and the recesses for my fasteners. And we're getting close, getting real close. Well, I've marked the location of my rail bolts and my pocket ears. I'm going to drill pilot holes through the hole stock on all of them. I'll do the pocket ears first. Well, ran into a bit of a problem. I had hoped to use blind nuts to attach my rail bolts. But as I'm drilling my pilot holes, something I didn't foresee is that my pilot holes end up right so my feather strip will be right there. This little eighth of an inch bead is going to show through in the final product. And the only way to do this is to recess it. I was planning on recessing this anyway, but recess it and then rebuild this. This is going to be visible. I just don't think there's a good enough way to do this so that it will look proper. So I was hoping to save myself a little bit of money. As you know, I am quite frugal. Um, these are about 50 cents a piece. Those specialty washers that pool tables use for the bottom of the rails are about three bucks a piece. And I need 24 of them, so do the math. What are we talking about, 75 bucks? And there's no way I can get them local, so I have to order them. So looks like pool table building is on hold for a while. I was really hoping to get the rails completely done today. I just don't see any way around it. Disappointing. Well, I've gone ahead and ordered my uh, I've gone ahead and ordered my uh, under under rail plates for the rail bolts. Oh, it's a tough pill to swallow. That was more money than I wanted to spend. But we've come this far to turn back now, so it is what it is. We had to do it. But what I can do is I can finish getting my pocket ear bolts all milled. And I've switched to a one inch Forstner bit to accommodate my bolt. And then when I'm done with that, I'll go ahead and drill the hole for the actual bolt hole itself. Well, while I'm waiting for my under rail place to show up, and I, I did order them from a different place than I ordered my pockets, so I'm hoping that we'll get them a little sooner, hopefully this week. But there is actually quite a bit that I could still do. I've actually cut my veneer, and I did that the same way that I cut the veneer for the, for the frame, and I actually cut my blinds. And I think I came up with a design that I like. I ended up cutting them off at a 10 degree angle to match the angle of the pockets, and it looks good to me. I like it. I started out with an angle here, then straight down. That looks stupid. Then I did a little zigzag angle here, straight down, then an angle here to match the angle of the legs. That looked really bad. So I ended up cutting them off at 10 degree angle, and they look good to me. I'm, I'm happy with it. So those are done. They're ready to go, and I'll mount those as soon as I get the cushions glued up. And now what I'm doing is I'm just, I got my veneer here, and I'm setting it into place, and I'm just going to cut this all by hand. 
Each pocket is made of leather and there's variations there. So I'm just going to cut this by hand and get everything lined up and fitting that pocket, the pocket leather, really nice. This is going to take me a little bit of time, but I think it's going to be worth it. Well, I've got my pieces all fit in nice and they look good. I'll do the final, final fitting once I get them glued and onto the sub rails themselves. But now it's actually time to start attaching the cushions to the rail itself. And what I've done is I've made myself a bit of a jig. And really all this is is a piece of plywood milled down to 9 16 of an inch, which happens to be the height of my little nose where the bottom of the cushion is going to set. I'll set this against the rail. I'll set the cushion on the rail. And then when my contact cement's ready to go, I'll just tip it up, set it into place, and we should be good. Now I'm using this DAP Weldwood contact cement. I did a test piece and it works pretty well. There is specific contact cement that people use for pool table applications, but I couldn't find it locally and to order it was hazard shipping costs. It was, it was going to cost me 100, like 100 bucks for a quart. Ridiculous. And I did a test on this using this stuff and it works pretty well, so I'm just going to use this. And this, you can find this about anywhere. All right, I put two thin coats of the contact cement on my cushion and also on my rail. I let it dry for about half hour, 45 minutes. Now it's time to actually attach, the, actually join these two up. Make sure I got everything lined up properly. I'll just tip it over gently. And a little bit of pressure. Perfectly straight. I'll let those set up. I'll let those cure for about a day before I trim them, trim the angles. Well, I've gotten as far as I can go with the rails until that contact cement cures. So what I decided to do is take some scrap lumber that I have lying around the shop and make a, make a drawer for underneath the table to store, you know, pool accessories, balls, sticks, racks, whatever. Um, I had the extra lumber, so I might as well. And I'm going to make the drawer three inches deep. So that's deep enough to hold balls. And I'm going to make it 42 inches wide. And I chose that width simply because that's about the width of the scrap piece of quarter inch plywood I have lying around the shop. And so right now I'm just ripping down my plywood to three inches. <laughs> All right, I got my drawer stock all cut to size and I'm going to now cut a dado in all four pieces. Now I didn't bother setting up this saw with the stack dado head cutter for such a small job like this. And my plywood is only a quarter inch thick. So what I'll do is I'll just make two or three passes to get that quarter inch width and it should be good. Well, it only took two passes to get the width that, or the width that I needed, so we're good. Now, using the same principle I did to run this long dado, I made a three-quarter inch wide, well, not quite three-quarters of an inch, the thickness of my plywood wide dado for the back panel. And on the front side, I'll just use a rabbit. I've gotten as close to that edge as I want to go because I don't want to ruin my fence and I don't feel like setting up a sacrificial fence. So I'll remove the rest of the chisel or just peel it off. A rabbit. All I need to do is just cut, cut the piece for the bottom, and we're ready to assemble this baby. All right, piece is cut, dado's done, time to assemble this bad boy. And just so you know, this uh, is classic drawer construction. I learned this from Norm. Thanks, Norm. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. So, glue in the dados, and I'll attach everything with brads. 
Again, if it was good enough for Norm, it's good enough for me. Now the bottom. No glue, we'll just let it float. Now many people would probably insist on using a dovetail or something stronger in the front where the drawer is going to get pulled all the time. But this drawer is not going to get a whole lot of use. It's going to get pulled out once or twice a week maybe. And I think this just doing a rabbit up here will be more than adequate. I keep doing pretty good at getting this stuff square. That's perfect. Let it dry. Now it's time to rip a piece of pine for the drawer front. So I just attached the faceplate for the drawer with glue and brads and that will hold just fine. And I'll put a pull on it later to match the, the, my bar area where the table's gonna go. Yeah.